Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Cynthia Sinclair. In our show this time, we'll review the most recent top five Think Tech talk shows and staff pick. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the public issues and the guests involved. Think Tech produces more than 35 talk shows every week in our downtown high-tech green screen studio. Our Think Tech talk show offerings are very diverse, and their coverage is also very diverse, covering things you might never have otherwise known. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before based on the number of views each of them has had on the internet. For this past week, the winning shows were as follows. Number one, from the series Beyond the Lines, hosted by Rusty Kamori. It's called Peace and Education with Dr. Maya Satoro Ng, Beyond the First Family with guest Maya Satoro Ng. Maya discussed her experiences as the famous sister of President Barack Obama and how she is helping to advance the objectives of the Obama Foundation. Maya shared valuable insights about her success as an educator, author, and co-founder of Seeds of Peace. Well, it's good because he's such a good man, and I really think about leadership, um, you know, with him as an example. Uh, being about uh, remaining grounded in, in your story and in your, in your roots, but also um, connecting to so many people far and wide. So I think he's a wonderful international leader, for instance. I think that um, he is really focused now, even post-presidency, on um, building out civic engagement, on identifying other leaders. So I'm grateful now to be able to uh, work with the Obama Foundation as a consultant to help to build the Asia Pacific Leadership Program, uh, which is about identifying um, leaders in the Asia Pacific uh, who have uh, done a lot but need perhaps support um, through wraparound um, mentorship and um, innovation and and uh, um, and and also uh, philanthropy uh, to take their projects to the next level. So these are leaders who are committed to the region, who are embedded. They are. Um, people who are, have boots on the ground. Maya, you're, you're a co-founder of that incredible organization called Seeds of Peace. Can you tell me about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, Carrie Yurosevich, who's a sort of early childhood and family expert, she and I uh, co-founded Seeds of Peace a few years ago uh, to help um, rebrand peace and to expand um, uh, to um, schools and uh, to the community. And the idea is to bring together educators, family, and community leaders in a 360 approach and to work on the algorithm of developing peace within, peace between, and peace and service to the community. And so our hope is that um, by doing these workshops that involve um, a three part you know, series uh, where uh, not only do participants uh, hear from uh, extraordinary organizations, initiatives, uh, nonprofits, educators, and youth in the community, but also develop action plans. Our action plans may involve um, mural building for a, a, an artist that creates a community space. Number two, from the series Hawaii Together, hosted by Kali'i Akina, it's called Population Growth Equals Greater Resources, the Simon Abundance Index, with guest Gail Pooley. Professor Pooley discussed his recent publication called the Simon Abundance Index, a new way to measure availability of resources, where he found that instead of making resources scarcer, population growth has gone hand in hand with greater resource abundance. He showed how data supports the finding that greater population growth results in greater resources and prosperity on the planet. You know, we've always lived in a world of scarcity. I mean, we never have enough time, we never have enough. It, the question is, how do we measure that? And uh, the, the opposite of scarcity is really abundance. And what is abundance? And so our uh, thinking uh, currently is, is, is there a definition of abundance that we can use to begin to measure changes in this relative scarcity? Now, before you give me that definition, let me just point out the shift I'm hearing you talk about. Shifting from thinking of, of competing for scarce resources to the mode of creating abundance. 
Absolutely. So what is abundance? You know, abundance is, is really this, the definition that, that we use uh, it is, is the measurement of prices relative to population. In the day when only the very wealthy could afford an, an iPad, Today, virtually anyone can afford a small little device that replicates what an iPad does. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, a absolutely. So w when we think about this, it's, it's are we being able to create things for one another that allow us to uh, escape poverty? Are we lifting ourselves out of poverty? And this process of creating new things, innovation, is, is really what we think about today. Uh, for example, when you, when you think about a physical resource, think about a piano. A piano has 88 keys, uh, but how many songs can you create with those 88 keys? I would imagine an infinite number of it's songs. It's an infinite number. So we live in this world where we have a physical limitation on the number of atoms that are on the planet, but we really have infinite ways that we can rearrange those atoms. Now that's very encouraging because you're moving economics away, as we said earlier, from looking at scarce resources, which pits us against each other to compete for those scarce resources, you're moving economics into a realm in which we cooperate to take resources and bring out an infinite amount of abundance. Exactly. My goodness, exactly. this so, is good stuff. Here's another thing. We, we look at an iPhone and we say, you know, it's about four or five ounces of atoms. Uh, you know, you got four or five ounces of water. Um, but these atoms have always, always been on the planet. We've just been able to come up with new ways to rearrange these atoms in ways that create value for one another. Number three from the series Screen Time Reset, hosted by Lauren Pear. It's called Why Tech Executives Send Their Children to Tech Light Waldorf, Cultivating the Whole Child and Honing Human Competitive Advantages with guests Alicia Maley Sadok and Yuka Otaka Bryce. While researching screen time, Lauren kept reading articles mentioning that tech light Waldorf schools in Silicon Valley are filled with children of technology executives. In this episode, Lauren talked to two Honolulu Waldorf teachers, Yuka Otaka Bryce and Alicia Maley, about Waldorf's stance on technology and why it is perfectly rational for tech-savvy parents to send their kids to tech light Waldorf despite the apparent contradiction. Yuka and Alicia highlighted Waldorf's focus on developmentally appropriate tech. They shared how minimizing media and tech exposure when children are young strengthens their imagination skills, interpersonal skills, and engagement with life and learning. What I love about it is it sort of creates this merge of academics and arts, experiential, hands-on learning, um, and kind of creates a very strong foundation um, for the children of building creativity, building critical thinking skills through this, this foundation of imagination and creating lifelong learners. What's really exciting is with our education system, it's such an active educational process for the children are really deeply engaged with all of them themselves. Um, and technology tends to be a passive experience where they're just sort of receiving information or receiving images and so it contradicts what we're trying to do with the children. You know, one of the things that we're looking at when we talk about the appropriate, you know, the appropriate time to bring something is, for instance, in second grade, when you look at a second grader's development, you're looking at somebody that is starting to toil with these ideas of morality. So Yuka's bringing fables, the silliness, these stories of the saints, you know, something that really grounds people and gives the kids something to enact with something that really means something to them, instead of like you're referencing with technology, you know, you can put a child on an iPad and all of a sudden they're having information put on them. So no matter what the developmental age, what we're trying to work with is the actual life of the child. I feel like a lot of parents are tackling this issue alone, but mm -hmm. it really is a community issue. And so oh, even absolutely. if there was a school that was a little more tech liberal, yeah. just the value of the fact that your class discusses what they think right. is appropriate, and that the parents and the school are kind of working together. I think there's so much value in that across mm -hmm. the spectrum mm -hmm. of um, you know tech light to right. to more tech liberal. And to make a shared agreement, you know, it's really it can be really iffy when we talk about technology because there's such a big split, right, in yeah. the way we raise children, and it's so easy to make somebody feel like they're a villain for you know texting somebody or 
for letting their kids watch a movie or for right. not having their kids on a screen, that they're behind. You know, there's so much of the back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I think no matter what realm you're coming from, the most important thing is that you do create a community agreement. Yeah, and conversation. Yeah. Right, a shared value. Number four, from the series At the Crossroads, hosted by Keisha King. It's called Red Table Talk Community Presents Relationships SOS, Love, Single, or Married, with guests Roderick Brassard and Roshan Brassard. The show covered marriage and infidelity and discussed how to win at marriage in a world that promotes divorce. It was part one of a two-part discussion on love and relationships. They spoke about tips on how to overcome darkest marital challenges and master second chances, embracing singlehood and developing healthy self-love, learning the art of listening, communicating, and mutual respect. So I've introduced you all as people who've been married over 20 years. Exactly how long have you been married? 22 years to be exact. 22. 22. Yes. Wow, congratulations. Yes. That is Thank worthy you. of applause. Give right. myself a pain. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me some depth right, that one. Right. Okay, I see you. I see you. Okay, that's good. 22 years. Yes. Give yourself a hand. Yes. I like that. You've talked a little bit about communication, mm -hmm. about respect, about money, about control, mm -hmm. and yet you survived all of those challenges. Did it get any worse? Did it go any deeper? Those are universal issues mm -hmm. that we've all faced. Did you have anything else that g gave you pause within your marriage? Oh, oh yes. yes. Most definitely, most yes. definitely. I mean, there, there, there's a, a lot of things that brought a lot of pause. I mean, some serious, not even when you say pause, uh, like a slam on the brakes, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been infidelity, you know, that, yes. that was a major blow, a major mm -hmm. blow. Um, like I said earlier, with the transition of always coming and going back and mm -hmm. forth, uh, with not just with the job, but the physical movement, that, that takes a lot out of a family. It takes a lot, mm -hmm. you know, when you have to up and plug and move your, your, your family to another place and relearn people, get to another ministry if you're in church, you know, a lot of different things that you, you know, you take for granted when you're in one place for a set amount of years that you don't have that when you every three or four years moving. Mm -hmm. um, health issues with families, you know, mm -hmm. our parents, you know, that, that's been another uh, major, you know, challenge as well. I mean, yeah. you want to share in there because I don't want to take up the whole spot. Well. As we were talking about our communication, communication was uh, a big issue for us because we didn't know how to communicate with one another. That's what led to um, us learning how to later on the art of listening. Okay. We didn't know how to listen to one another. We were hearing each other, but we weren't listening. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, it brought about, as we spoke, the infidelity on both of our parts. It wasn't just on one end, it was both of our parts to where infidelity had taken place. And when we learned how to communicate and when we learned how to listen, that, first of all, we had to really bring God into our relationship. Yes. 
Yes. Because without God, we wouldn't have been able to function, be together, and stay together. Number five from the series Hispanic Hawaii, hosted by Richard Concepcion. It's called Venezuela's Political, Social, and Economic Crisis with guest Teotiste Duran. On January 23rd, Juan Guaido, president of the National Assembly of Venezuela, was sworn in as the interim president of Venezuela during a demonstration in Caracas, thus ignoring the government of Nicolas Maduro. To understand Venezuela's political, social, and economic crisis, we need to examine different points of view, which together will help us have a realistic vision of what is happening there. Teotiste Duran spoke about the crisis and how it can create multinational conflict and affect global economic and political stability. ¿Cuál es su presidente? Mi pres nuestro presidente es Juan Guaidó, porque Maduro es usurpó, tiene usurpado la presidencia a partir de enero. De enero para acá, él ya no, no es presidente. Por lo cual, Juan Guaidó, el que es el de las presidente de la Asamblea Nacional, y de acuerdo a, lo, a los artículos de la Asamblea Nacional, o sea, de la Constitución, él es el que tomó el, el poder presidencial. Entonces, vamos, vamos, a vamos, a traer, este... vamos a traer ese punto cuando Maduro tomó poder después que uh, Chávez murió. Eh, Maduro se convirtió al presidente. Y la inflación durante Maduro hasta ahora ha subido de un millón porcentaje a 10 millones. Y ha tenido más de 466, 66, 65 políticos en prisión. Y cuando fueron a las elecciones, no había ningún grupo opositorio. Entonces, las elecciones fue observada internacionalmente y fue ilegítima. Y por eso Guaidó dice que él no es el presidente legítimo. Por eso, no, presidente legítimo. Por eso es que él, ¿quién dice que no es el presidente legítimo? Eh... Y que Maduro no es legítimo porque su uh, elecciones no fueron no, fraudables. fueron fraudables. Él fueron fraudables. Es más, él no ha ganado ninguna elección, porque en el 2000, cuando él se lanzó de presidente, que Chávez supuestamente, él lo dijo en cadena nacional, de que cuando él se iba para Cuba a, a operarse, pero que si a él le sucedía algo, que, él, que votaran por Maduro porque ese era su heredero, como si eso, Venezuela hubiese sido una hacienda de él, sea el heredero, entonces hubo mucha gente, hubo mucha gente, que no votamos, muchísima gente no votamos por ese señor. Y, pero él de todas formas agarró las elecciones. Eso, las elecciones fue ganadas por Capriles, de verdad fue ganadas por Capriles, lo digo porque yo que soy de allá y nosotros andábamos en las marchas y todo, Capriles tenía demasiadísima gente, pero lamentablemente como el poder, el poder lo ha tenido ellos, pues entonces le quitaron las elecciones así facilito. We also have a staff pick from the series Code Green, hosted by Howard Wig. It's called Making the Invisible Visible at Kamehameha Schools, Furtive Learning, with guest Dora Nakafuji. The School Innovation Group at Kamehameha Schools is developing an entirely new way of learning, where the students become involved in campus energy projects and learn STEM skills while doing things, learning by accident. Educators are realizing that conventional classroom teaching is minimally effective. The invisible visible method literally brings energy efficiency measures home. Every generation, mm -hmm. we have new technology that evolves and materials that come up. And our current times, we have some amazing technologies. And even though in the past we've had great observations, great lessons learned, and ways of doing things, mm -hmm. the new technology and the new materials afford us some new efficiency. Wow. And I think that's, that's really the challenge, is mm -hmm. how do we bring these types of skill sets into our learning environment, not only allow the kids to experience it, but also operationally, how do mm -hmm. we gain efficiencies and how do we develop our next practices rather mm -hmm. than just mm -hmm. best practices. It's really hands-on, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and if you put these tools into practice, mm -hmm. it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that going to that old adage of flying by the seat of your pants, which mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. a sense of adventure, but mm -hmm. it's also what 
kids gravitate to because there's a sense of yeah. exploration and creativity. K kids do not like to sit in classrooms <laughs> and stare at a teacher who's talking. They want a sense of adventure. And if we can give them three-dimensional stuff to play with, I, I think that really enhances the learning experience. When we talk about energy, um, it, it's very hard to visualize electric use and other things, mm -hmm. but when you turn on the light, you're mm -hmm. actually using a lot of energy. Yeah. And yeah. many times we don't even really appreciate how much energy we use mm -hmm. throughout the day. And as we introduce renewables and other types of uh, generation onto our islands as part of our 100% renewable um, goals, we actually need to start asking that question of how are we using it mm -hmm. um, and how are we more sustainably integrating that into our environments. Our project really is just a small sliver of the entire portfolio of all the things that are happening. Um, and this was really designed to address kind of our understanding of our various campuses and our places and how much energy we were using and how to more effectively manage mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the energy use. Because we want to be conscientious, we also want to be good, good citizens. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we need to actually understand some of these things that relate to energy, whether it be water and other, uh, other um, underlying infrastructures mm -hmm. for operation, but energy being a key component. You can always find the links to these shows in our daily email advisories. If you don't already get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. These are only samplings from the top five in the staff pick from across our 35 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these top five and staff pick shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community, great content at ThinkTech. If you have questions or comments about these or any of our shows, please let us know. And yes, it's okay to share them with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for watching our shows and for supporting our efforts at ThinkTech. And now, let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. 
for our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Cynthia, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Cynthia does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation and excellence wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Cynthia Sinclair. Aloha, everyone. Mm-hmm.